Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of So Chatty with Walter and myself. And it is June the 23rd, 2023, and this is episode 103. So, as you know, we're back from the East Coast. We talked about that last week, and I talked about some of the fabrics I bought. And one of those sets of fabrics was the African fabrics, and I bought a kit. Walter bought a kit, too. But I completed one of the kits I bought. I bought a couple of kits, actually. This was for a table runner. And I'm going to show you what the final, uh, what it looks like. There it is. Um, I like the African fabrics, the way they look. Uh, they're okay. Um, but they're expensive fabrics. So this was the uh, design that came with the kit. Um, but I'll tell you what. I don't know if they were cheaping out or what. But you see the four columns in the middle? That's all. That's what they considered the finished pattern was just those four columns. Mm. They said nothing about borders or anything like that. And of course, they didn't supply material for any of that. And considering that kit was, I'm trying to think what I paid for it. I paid quite a bit for the kit. Um, it wasn't particularly inexpensive. Um, so I added to the skinny border and then the wider border on the outside. And the backing fabric on this is one that I had laying around that isn't, is not African fabric, but I thought it kind of went with it. But you know, really uh, cheaping right out. Just got interrupted. We had somebody at the door wanting to clean our windows. We don't want our windows clean. We like them dirty. But anyway, so I was saying is it seemed a little bit like they cheaped out on it because it, when I put the four columns together, it didn't look like a finished project. It needed borders. So I had some other African fabric that I bought uh, when I was at the show. So I used that for the two borders as well. Um, but anyways, I have more to say about the African fabrics and about uh, Meerkat where I bought it a little later in today's episode. I've been working on two other projects. Um, I have nothing to show with the sister-in-law quilt, Mirror Mirror. You've seen it before it's sitting on Lucy I did think that maybe this morning I would get it set up on Lucy and get started on quilting on it of it but I decided to do the table runner instead and then I got waylaid by other projects so nothing more on that one and I'm working on a Halloween table runner uh in it's an in the hoop design for my embroidery machine um it's going to take a while to do but I love doing those kind of projects and it was on sale from designs by Juju so I have nothing really to show you with that yet because I haven't got much of it done but that's coming up at some point in time but Walter's got some fabric to show you because he's going to go to a sew day tomorrow while well, we're having the pop-up sew day here more about that in a moment and show him the fabric Walter let me get you up here there yeah you. actually i've had this for a little while but uh i asked steve if he'd like the shirt of course i was this. so kitties. i think i've done right side up i'm not sure it's yeah. directional yeah, yeah i got right side up so uh yeah it'll be kitties not my usual color scheme but everything mm. looks good on me so don't i matter. think it's a nice color actually yeah even Thank though you. it's not your color scheme but i like the kitties on it i already have a kitty shirt a different one i like those ones I know all about the kitties on the shirt. So those are what we're working on. I'm trying to get back up to full speed here. Um, Walter's at the same speed he's always at. Walter's getting a new new thing next week. He a was new at, toy. A new to, well, it's not really a toy. It's a building. What, what are you getting, Walter? I'm getting a, uh, for years and years and years after living in this house, <laughs> I've always said I wanted a, a, a storage shed and uh i was looking at them to you know the prefab ones that you can build your uh build yourself or whatever and i said this time steve said earlier this year if you if you want one why don't you just get one bill so he is so i'm getting it built it's actually a guest house actually it's a good size it's 12 <laughs> feet by eight feet it's a guest house yeah there won't be any guests in it he'll put all kinds of he's building he's getting a he shed made that's yeah. what it is he said they come next week to build it and put it up and uh yeah so you you were out marking the ground for, for where the plot yeah people think we're digging a double grave yeah out there you got it all marked off now okay yeah we've decided uh we're they'll have to carry us out of this house and just put us in the backyard so whoever buys the house afterwards they're going to have us there no but yeah so that's exciting 
and hopefully this will go smoother than our window has been going and that's a story for another day on sunday for tune in if you want to hear the continuing saga of the transom window yeah that'll be on Stephen and walter live okay so uh some other announcements here uh as usual wednesday morning sewing with stephanie and Stephen. we had this week without stephanie this time uh i guess turnarounds fair play she did the last one without me and now i did the, this one without her that was because stephanie got a call at the last minute to fly off to chicago to help at a trade show there help a friend out um she said she had a good time and can't wait to hear what she she was really curious about how that would compare to other ones that she has been at like quilt con or quilt market and things like that um i did look it up though it's called the h and h something it sounds like it's a general crafting hobby type show didn't notice anything about quilting they had sewing stuff they had tapestry they had embroidery and they had a whole bunch of other things card making you name it uh it was there so i'll have to ask find out from stephanie uh, what that was like. Maybe she'll tell us more about it uh, on Saturday because next announcement is we're having a pop-up sew day, as you probably already know, this coming Saturday. For those of you that are fans of Walter, alas, Walter will not be part of the pop-up sew day. He's off to go with his sewing class for their, as I call it, sew day at the club kind of a thing. And uh, originally it was scheduled for the 24th. So I thought, well, I'm not going to get a pop-up sew day in this month. Then they changed it to the 17th, and that was the day we were coming home. So I thought, hmm, well, I can have a pop-up sew day on the 24th. So I announced it was on the 24th, and then they changed it back to the 24th, the in-person one. And I said, well, I'm not going, because I'd rather be with my peeps anyways. Because, to be honest, garment sewers? Boring. Just boring. Oh, Look, another skirt. Oh, look, another shirt. Of course, Walter didn't say, oh, look, another quilt. So yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. But in my way of thinking, I lug all my stuff down there. Yeah, I know. It doesn't start till 10 in the morning. By the time you get all your stuff out of the car, get yourself all going and getting into the mood of it, you've almost killed an hour right then and there. And then yeah no i'd rather be here at home with all my stuff around me and all my peeps around me so yes you're all very special to me right okay moving on craft and chat advanced warning we will be having craft and chat on the first wednesday of july which is july the 5th that's so it's not next week but it's the week after um also coming up this Saturday, no, not this Saturday, the next Saturday after that, which happens to be July the 1st, that is Canada Day here. And I'm a special guest on the Guy Who Sews uh, Saturday Live uh, show. Uh, he thought it would be appropriate to have a Canadian, and I'm the only Canadian he knows. So there you go. I don't know what I'm doing that day. I thought I might do a little mini trunk show uh, along with that. I have to talk to Sean about that yet and show some of my... Canadian themed quilts that I have made over the last few years. Um, I usually try to do one a year. Don't know why, I just do. Okay, so other things. My iron is back. You know, my smelly iron, guess what? It never smelled. All the time they had it, it never once smelled. There was a cracked elbow on it, uh, which they fixed. Um, and they did do a cleaning of it. They said there was some calcium deposit, but not that much. Well, I had just cleaned it not about two months before it went into them. Um, and I said, well, that's good to know. But of course, you know, it did cost because they charge $125 an hour plus parts and all that kind of stuff. And I also already paid about $65 for the inspection of it to see if there was something that needed to be fixed. But what they do with that is they take off the final bill, that $65 you've already paid. So in total, it cost me about $130 to have a new elbow put on. The part was only $2.98. So that's a minimum one hour charge. However, it's good to know that my iron is in fine shape. And I think I figured out what the smell was. You know, I told you it was smelled like burning 
crayons, melting crayons or plastic? Well, it was sitting on sort of a plastic protective sheet, which had sort of melted to the yeah, bottom. Yeah, isn't heat resistant. No, and didn't really think at the time that that was really the cause, because if you'd smelled this, you would think there was something really major going on. But that has to be it, because I cleaned that all off before we took it in. And I told the guy about that, too. And he kind of said, well, you know, they don't, they get hot, but they don't really get that hot. Well, maybe over time. I mean, my iron's on sometimes from morning to, to from dusk to dawn. Yeah, and sometimes dawn, overnight because I turned it off last night. I thought I turned it off. Oh, well. There you go. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Anyways. I forgot to tell you about it. I just remembered right now. So I thought I'd mention it on air. Yeah, of course. Of course you'd mention it on here. Right. See, Walter's absolutely perfectly practically perfect in every way just him and mary poppins well i know where he can shove his umbrella okay so let's talk a little bit about the african fabrics again about uh meerkat meerkat shawawawawaya i don't know how you say the other name i think the other name is actually the name for the type of african fabric but i'm not particularly sure they are located in Alora, ontario which isn't that far from us. It's an hour and a half drive or so, uh, kind of a thing. Um, but I've never been to their shop uh, because I don't think the last time we were anywhere near Alora, it even it actually existed. I'm not sure how long they've been in business uh, for that. But anyways, we had some questions about their stuff. Um, and it's things that weren't necessarily that obvious to us when yeah. uh, we were looking at their fabric. Like one of the things was the size of it. Now I bought five half meter um, cuts, okay? If you get a half meter cut, let's put it in English, basically a half meter cut or half yard cut. Let's say half yard cut because most people think more in yards than in meters, okay? So a half yard cut, you'd expect it to be with the fabric anywhere from 40 to 44 inches wide and then a half yard would be uh 18 inches right these weren't these pieces measured at 36 inches uh this way and 20 inches from salvage to salvage now i do know there's variation in in those kind of things but i wondered if and i, I kind of answered my own question i figured okay this this fabric comes from africa it's probably a different process for making it because it definitely has a different feel from anything I've ever used before. So maybe their bolts aren't as wide. Well, I wrote to, I believe her name is, I want to say it's Celeste, but I'm not sure. I think it is. Yeah, I was looking to see how she signed the email. I had three questions for her and she got right back to me. And yes, yeah, Celeste. And she wrote, she didn't give me the brush off. She wrote very detailed questions here. And I thought if you're if you're thinking about getting African fabric or whatever, or dealing with meerkat, then you would want to know these answers. So um, she wrote, as far as the size of the fabric was concerned, she says, uh, I don't know how you say it, is a heritage. Look at this. It's S H. It's probably, there's probably Shwish. some silent letters. Shweshwe. 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 Shweshwe or something like From that. From now on, she's going to be called the African fabric is a heritage product woven on 36 inch wide looms. So half meters you purchase would be 36 by 20 inches before washing with the fabric. Now she says the width of fabric though is 36 inches. Yeah, so why? Okay, so whereas like normally we'd get salvage to salvage, we'd get uh, yeah. uh, 40 or 45, right? Yeah, 40 to 45, yeah. yeah. So anyways, the production history dates to colonial times, mostly in Manchester, UK. In 1992, the Gama Textiles Company purchased the rights from the colonial mother company, and now it is South African. But this product is still made the same as the indigo calico of colonial times. So there's something interesting. Um, they're calling it African fabrics, but they're saying that the production history dates to colonial times, mostly in Manchester, the UK of UK. So it's not African fabric. 
it's British. I'm a little confused. Okay. But then they say the company now is in South Africa. So now it does come from South Africa. So, so now then it is African African. fabric now, but it wasn't originally. Mm. Uh, it was calico. Um, anyway, she says she provided a video, and I've put the link to the video um, down below where she explains this whole process and everything. It's a very good video, actually. It's very short. Um, check it out. Um, so... That gave me more information. I figured that it had something to do with the manufacturing process. Okay. But I just want to check out of curiosity. My second question was, well, and this was more Walter's. Walter bought a kit. And what was Yeah, my kit was kit? um thir uh, 133 dollars And it was supposed to have four meters of um the shishui or whatever fabric and uh or African fabric. And it had four meters of the African fabric and then a background fabric that went on the front of the quilt as well. I thought when I purchased it, it was African fabric, but it turned out to be muslin fabric. Actually, a decent quality muslin, yeah. but not African fabric, right? And it was so, in sort of a beigey, well, white color. It's unbleached muslin. So mm -hmm. unbleached muslin looks the same as everything. It's an off white fabric, it's a green color, actually. Now, the, the display quilt that she had, I thought, had um, a white fabric in it, or it looked like a white fabric, unless this muslin ends up, after time, washing out to a white color. I don't know. You know but it, it does, doesn't feel like the muslin we're, we're used to. No. It, it's a little thicker, nicer feel to it, and it did, it did have some specs in it, didn't it? Yeah, like I have specs, but a lot of the muslin that you buy has uh, oh, does specs it? in it. Because yeah. okay, I never buy muslin, so yeah. I'm not sure about it. But uh, anyways, I asked her about that. I, and I said to her, you know, like, we're not really complaining about the quality of it. Because it did feel nice, but never seen a quilt that has, uh, that uses muslin, you know, as a backing fabric. I mean, maybe there are some out there. I just don't know about them. But anyways, I asked her about that. And she says, I'm blown away by your compliments of the muslin I used for the stripy HST quilt. That's the name of the pattern that Walter got with the kit. And I wasn't really giving her profuse comment. No, no, I wasn't <laughs> making compliments. Actually, I, to my knowledge, the muslin that I ever ended up purchasing in the past, usually... You use it to uh, do a test pattern on a garment using muslin because it's cheaper than buying quilting cotton or something like that or a regular fabric. Like, this is what I actually asked. I said, I bought the strippy uh, HST quilt kit and it came with muslin for the background fabric. I have never seen a kit for a quilt that uses muslin. The quilt you had on display had a white background, which I prefer color-wise. I was pretending I was Walter when I was writing this. Whereas the muslin was more of an off-white beige color. Also, your kit works out to $22 per meter, which by my math includes the muslin at $22 per meter. I have never paid that much for muslin. Granted, the muslin in the kit is a little better quality than the average muslin I have purchased in the past, but nevertheless, that seems a little extreme. I have felt that the muslin in I have felt the muslin, and it is not the same quality as the African fabrics in the kit, so I feel a little overcharged, and I don't really want to mix muslin with regular quilting cotton. I did not read your description on the package before I bought it. You do say that you use muslin in this kit, but why have on display a sample quilt that looks like it uses regular quilting cotton for the background? This was a little misleading in my opinion. So her answer to this was, um, I'm blown away by your compliments of the muslin I used for this stripey HST quilt. Okay, I didn't think well, I was You said that. it was a little better quality. Well, yeah, but I mean, didn't really make that much because it i'm very fussy about the quality of muslin i source so it has paid off the muslin in the kit is the same quality cost of the quilt kit 16 fat quarters at 23 dollars per meter plus two meters of muslin at 18 dollars per meter plus the pattern of five dollars at five dollars equals 133 dollars so her math she shows the math so actually she was charging less for muslin uh, it's still expensive. However, she said at $23 a meter, I think the stuff on her website is $22. Yeah, well, that for the fat quarters. Yeah. Well, the half meter cuts I bought were $11. Maybe mm -hmm. that was a show special. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. It didn't say, you know, like a dollar less. 
Anyway, she says, I like using muslin in monochromatic quilts when I want a classic vintage look. It goes well with the hand quilting too. Um, she say more about that. Next page. She actually included some pictures of how she's used it. Now, this is a close up, I think, of the quilt that's in the kit. Now, to me, that looks that's lighter. Nice. Yeah, it's hard with it with the camera here. What it's because going to show that, you, but... uh, I show you the muslin. If you I show you the muslin, it's actually more a uh, color of, like of this cat. So, and then she says, "Here's another quilt made with African fabric and muslin. 150 Canadian w women waiting for hand quilting. I think this is what the quilt is called. 150 Canadian women, and this is it's in reds." and the but but she says there's muslin in that too well again it looks white now maybe there's a color shift when she's taking the picture that could happen but oh, she had one on display yeah she had one on display and it looked white yeah but anyways it's, uh, like i said unless it washes out white yeah. yeah it might be personal taste when it comes to it i have never made a quilt using or ever thought of using muslin for backing but she Plus the stuff that she has in her in her uh, sample here doesn't look like it has the little specks in it. That no, but it it maybe it may not, another yeah. type of muslin. So yeah. she maybe she when she put the kit together yeah, she didn't have exactly. I don't know. It's not a major thing, but you know, just I'm glad she answered the questions though yeah. because if she had just passed me over and you know whatever, then that would give me she obviously cares about her business and she cares about her customers so that impresses me um the last thing i asked her was about washing i said you have two different versions one you included in the package but on your website there's a different set of instructions which is the correct version or does it matter and if it doesn't matter why not just have one version because as a customer who has never worked with african fabrics before this i found to be very confusing and basically what she said in both of them well first of all she recommends that you hand wash them or soak them actually uh in water for about 10 minutes or so squish them around a little bit take them out hang them to dry don't put them in the dryer okay this doesn't even threat press me much but one of her other instructions said the one that came that was the one that's on her website the ones in the package said you could put them at um low temperature in your washing machine but then take them out and hang dry them and again don't use any detergent so you know what i did i took i took one of the half meters that i bought cuts threw it in the washing machine we have a front loader threw it in the washing machine put it on warm wash and i put it in for on uh express wash 26 minutes and then when it was done i took it out and I threw it in the dryer for on time dry for 40 minutes. No problem. Now it did fray a little bit, but I don't think I never pre-washed my fabrics. Um, but I don't think it frayed much more than what regular quilting cotton does. And it ironed out beautifully. So basically you're doing this because they they oversize it um to keep it really stiff because it has something to the weave. In fact, she says. I had the production company's washing instructions to all kits, but what I have posted on my website is what I do myself and what I share with my customers when we meet face to face. African fabric is heavily sized, and before you use it, you need to rinse the sizing out for two reasons to soften the fabric and to allow it to shrink. The sizing coats the threads in the weave, so when it dissolves out in water, there are tiny gaps in the weave, and the threads settle together into those tiny gaps, which causes the fabric to shrink in the pre-wash. Also, the indigo dye does bleed, so you want to allow for that. When I pre-wash, I just soak everything in warm, hot, warm to hot water for a few minutes, and then hang it out to dry. It is the same synthetic indigo dye used for denim jeans. Pre-washing and washing. All African fabrics need to be pre-washed before use. When washing finished items, I recommend a cold water wash on a gentle cycle. I do not put hand quilted items in the washing machine. When I wash the stripey HST, which is hand quilted, I placed it in lukewarm water in the bath with half a cup of salt added to fix the indigo and prevent bleeding. Um, okay. 
this is one reason why I don't think I may necessarily be purchasing African fabrics again, because there seems to be, unless you were doing a very special wall hanging or quilt for somebody that wasn't going to get washed a lot, then maybe yes, if you like the patterns and the colors. But after I did the test piece, I took the other four meters, five meters that I bought, half meters that I bought, um, or actually the ones for, um, well, I did those and I did the ones that came in the kit for the table runner that I showed you. I threw them all in the washing machine. I threw in a color, a couple of colored pictures. I did it on warm. I did it for express wash 26 minutes and took it out, threw them in the dryer and put them on uh, dry for 40 minutes. And I didn't adjust the temperature. The temperature was on hot. Okay. They came out a little bit of fraying. Again, uh, the color catchers came out clean. And some of that fabric in there was the blue, which I'm assuming is the indigo uh, in it. Um, nothing really bled. Um, and uh, I pressed them and they pressed easily. They did not come out in a big ball. So I don't know. And as far as if I was to make a quilt or when Walter makes his quilt, actually, I have a quilt to make out of them, too, because uh, I bought a quilt kit, too too but different from his um i intend after i'm finished to do exactly what i do with it after um i do at wash do any of my quilts i'm gonna throw it in the washing machine because i measured it before it went in the washing machine and i measured it after it came out of the washing machine if it shrank it shrank less than an eighth of an inch which there's quilting cottons you can buy regular quilting cottons that will do more than that will shrink more so if you're pre-washing them to start with these fabrics, I don't think you have anything to worry about. So maybe it's more because she does a lot of hand quilting and I don't know. So anyways, I thought it was nice that she took the time to write me detailed answers. Um, and uh, yeah, you might be interested in um, checking them out. I think I have a link for them. I don't think I have a link for them today in this show notes, but I uh, reviewed for next week on Idiot Quilter, and it'll be in there. But it's just just type in Meerkat Fabrics, and you'll find them. They'll, they'll pop up uh, with that if you're interested. And just be aware you are going to spend the top dollar for those fabrics because they are a specialty fabric. So anything else you want to say about African fabrics? No, not really. No. They're kind of interesting, but... Uh... Like you said, I'm not sure if uh, you need to do. First of all, it, the the fabric is skinny. Yeah. When you buy it, so you have to account for that, and it ends up being kind of pricey. So. Well, yeah. If at, you have a special project you want to do or something like that, maybe. But at twenty three dollars a meter, plus you have to remember you are not getting full normal width. You're getting basically half. So it gets kind of expensive. Yeah with it but if you see something it does give right. you a kind of a unique look though. yeah it does okay so now we're going to talk about the featherweight and i have some pictures to show you what it looks like and what it came with and talk a little bit about it so you know that uh colleen uh who's one of my regular subscribers we went and we met with colleen in charlottetown because that's where she lives and she gifted me this Singer sewing machine. And this is the case. This is the original case for it. Not a thing wrong with this case. And the reason I mentioned that is because there are people getting cases that aren't in such great uh, shape when they get a featherweight. And there's this big movement now where they redo the whole case, putting colored, I don't know, I want to call it Mac tack, but it's vinyl, it's something else, and dressing them right up. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I this think case. it looks good as being an authentic case. Well, that's like what I say. Antique case. Right? Yeah, it's an antique case. So, and they often say when it comes to antiques, you should never necessarily refinish them uh, if they're in relatively good shape because it reduces their value. I don't know if that's true or not, but anyways, that's the case. And this is inside the case, the top layer. Now, that big part at the top where there's a uh, gadget in it right now. Um, that's where the foot pedal and cord go. And then that whole tray lifts out. And there you go. There's the machine with its original manual. 
It is a 221. So those of you that already have featherweights know that that was a very popular make. Is this one worth a lot of money? No, it's not rare. I looked it up at the featherweight shop and it's serial numbers. And this one was made in Scotland. Although Colleen told me that, although it may say it was made in Scotland, they sometimes mix parts from Canada and from Europe in with them as well. So I don't know in the case of this machine. But you can see, I have not cleaned it. I haven't even run a wet cloth over it. So, you know, all the scrolling work on it, the decorative scrolling, that's all original. That's in really good shape because oftentimes when you buy one of these machines, that stuff is peeled off or scraped away. So that's all in great shape. The bulb and the light, I think, is its original. It It's working. It works. Um, it, the whole thing is, okay, our doorbell just went off. It looks like we just got a parcel. Guys laying on the step. Um, we did take a look. I took a look inside. It's a bit greasy inside, but apparently they're supposed to be greasy inside the gears because you can actually buy grease. There's special grease that you use on these. There's a, a brand that the featherweight shop sells. It's their own. It's called retro sewing machine grease or something. And they have videos on what to do with it. Um, I saw one of the videos, they talk about uh, getting in there with some kerosene and cleaning off the gears and then re-greasing them up. Well, it's running. I don't think I need to go to that extreme. I'd like, I'm going to take a look at it at some of point course to, you will. to take a look. To of see course you will. Um, now, of course, oiling it, um, there's a bunch of different spots where you're supposed to oil it. And if you use it all the time, they recommend you oil it every week. Uh, for use, I won't be using it that much. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate getting this as a gift, and it is going to go in a place of honor. And I know where that place is going to be. Uh, I might use it sometimes, but I'm a 21st century type person. I love my computers and my electronics and my machines that thread themselves and and cut the thread automatically and do all kinds of other things it this, does stitch pretty good it does it has a very nice stitch and everybody says that about it now it was a little bit of a bitch to thread in comparison to a modern machine but i think if you do it enough it'll become second nature it's not that difficult to do it the thing that we had the bit of problem with was getting the top thread to catch the bobbin th thread and pull it up um we played around with that it has a i don't know if i have a picture of that yeah i do there's what the bobbin looks like so it's a side loading bobbin and it does it's not unlike what um bernina's and other machines that side load it looks very much the same that popped mm -hmm. out you drop a bobbin into it they have metal uh bobbin bobbins which is fine uh there's many models of sewing machines that come with metal ones today um you do sort of have to line it up and it has to click but we had some trouble but we took the plate that's not that's a blurry picture of it uh let's go back to this picture here this metal plate has two screws in it not easy to get that up but that plate has a gap in it right up here and this part has to be in that gap and we're not sure if it was seated right or not but we checked it out and made sure it was seated correctly um i don't know if it needs a, a minor adjustment or it's just me when i was putting it in um i've had a little problem with it getting it to pull up the bobbin thread but once you do you're okay i mean it might be just one of those things you have to get used to um yeah, I think there's uh, there's probably a a feel on how to get that yeah. to work properly. We're not we have modern machines. We're not used to pulling bob bobbins right up. So no. And here's another shot of it. That's the flywheel, or they give it another name, but you can see the motors on the back. Now there's something uh, a video on the featherweight shop website where they talk about greasing uh, your motor. And there's a, supposedly there's a little screw at the back. You just open that up and squirt the Grease into there to do that. This little lever down here is your forward and reverse. When it's down, 
the feed dogs are pulling your fabric through when it's up at the highest position uh it works as a reverse but it also adjusts I don't know if I have a picture of the front of that I guess I got to go back to this picture you can't see it well in this picture but there's some numbers here and they represent how many stitches per inch like it goes up as high as 30 and I think it goes as low as like four or six something like that and this kind of confused me how to set this you're supposed to raise this little lever up until the base of this little screw that's here is next to the number you want and then you tighten it up you loosen it off first then you tighten it up um and that will adjust your stitches and yeah it does it just I had a little problem when I was using it I, that's when I couldn't catch my bobbin thread again so I don't know if it was that thing or just a quirk anyways yeah I'm used to pushing a button if I want to change <laughs> my stitch like you know boom boom not this now well, see it's in around here somewhere I think what happens is you get a stitch length that you like and you yeah uh, you pretty much stick with it right? and right now I do have it at stitch length that I like that looks nice and that's where I'm leaving it um oh yeah another thing okay you see the spool this was designed for old-fashioned wooden spools uh and for ones that they call it stacked wine stacked wine means it just goes around and around and around cross wine is when it looks like if you look at the spool of spool of thread the thread looks like it's making an x across the spool and that's how orophil is wound now apparently i watched one of their videos they have an attachment which is a, a thread stand but it fits in i think this here this little hole right here it goes into that hole and then you if you want to use um cross we uh i don't know cross what's the term i'm looking for cross wound uh thread uh that makes it uh, a little better it'll pull it off because the orophil th threads are are tall you can also use a cone of thread on it too if you have that as well they showed and they have another gizmo that there's a post under here right um that you can get that uh will allow you to put your spool of thread horizontally on the on here and apparently for cross wound threads that's supposed to work uh better with a machine like this I'm haven't purchased one of those um it works fine with I think that's Guterman that's on yeah. it right now um but anyways so yeah there's a lot of accessories you get okay you also notice here you can't really see it very well I did order a quarter inch foot for it it came with a foot um let me show you this is the back here's the motor right here it's very compact oh by the way there's no on or off switch you plug it in it's on I thought the little switch that was at the front might be on and off that just turns off the light and turns the light off so once you've got it plugged in it's ready to go there's no on and off switch oh and there's no thread well there is a thread cutter there's a little bracket you can't see it's behind the the lifter uh lever here um it wouldn't cut hot butter and it's very very awkward it's kind of this u-shaped thing and it, by what I can figure out you put the thread in around behind and try to catch it on this thing and then pull it kind of a deal I'm thinking of buying one of those little uh thread cutters that you can mount on the side of your machine that are you know I forget what they call them I've got one on both of my machines I love them I can get one over at ultimate sewing um okay this is what it came with now this was the foot that was on the machine um that I would think that almost looks like that might be a more modern foot but maybe not it might be the original well actually no because in the manual it showed these four things coming with it this is for making binding for binding something now you can't it says you can't bind a quilt with it um which it's not wide enough uh for that but if you were putting binding on something smaller or whatever um that's what that gizmo's for is it also because your needle uh, plunge isn't uh, deep enough to uh... that could be yeah as well um and the instruction manual is very detailed it's uh they should make manuals like they used to make them because you know they yeah. they really cover everything and the english is very good the grammar in it too not like the ones that you get broken english in all the time this is an adjustable hem guide 
So I didn't really study how this works because I don't intend to be hemming much on it. And this is a ruffler. Um, so if you want ruffles, you know, you can use this to ruffle, I guess. Um, they're all in pretty good shape. This one looks a little tarnished, but I'm sure you can clean it up without any problem. I'm going to use it. Um, so that's what it all came with. And those are all the pictures I had to show you. So does it sew? Well, you'll have to wait till the idiot quilter this week. Because I did a little video and I showed you. Hint, it does. Okay. It's in. It's very quiet. Too. It's very quiet. Very quiet. Um, now I, I was on something today and talking to some people about that also own featherweights because I, I have now drank the Kool-Aid, I guess, uh, in featherweights, um, people go nuts over them. They talk about if you're doing straight stitching, it's great. They're so lightweight. They're great to take someplace. Like if you're in a class or you're going to a retreat or something like that. And I do appreciate getting this machine, and I am thinking of doing a small project on it at some point in time to really put it through its paces um, with it. But will I take it to a retreat or a class? Right now, my answer is probably not, because like I said, I'm all about technology. Okay, this one's just a little too old school for me. However, never say never. Um, it's going to look great in the place of honor that I'm going to have it for. It's, uh, and as I said, this was a gift that, you know, it was too much. It was just too much, really. Because these suckers are going for like 500 bucks. Um, that's what somebody was telling me today. Some people are actually taking them and, and painting them. I, which I don't like that idea because you're kind of ruining, um, the, well, um, yeah, you you the, the part of having one of these machines is the history behind these machines. Is it's a vintage machine? Yeah. Um. Now maybe they're painting them because they're so badly scarred up and stuff like that that you can't really do anything else. So they're painting them. Maybe that's the whole point. I do know that the fat feather featherweight shop sells a polishing kit, a restoration kit for cleaning them up, I guess, and buffing them and whatnot. I can't really, it's not cheap. It's about 60 bucks American or something for it. Um, I really can't see investing in that for this machine because as I said, this machine, well, you saw the picture of it. I haven't done anything to it. It's mm -hmm. in perfect, perfect shape. So, you know, it's not broke, don't fix it kind of a deal. So anyways, I'm now a proud owner of a featherweight machine. And once again, really appreciate the gift from Pauline. Okay, so that's about it for us today. Haven't got anything else. Um, so just a reminder, pop-up so day this coming Saturday, starting at 8 a.m. Come whenever you wish. Uh, links in the show notes below. And those of you on my mailing list. Oh, yes, by the way, I have a new mailing list. Uh, it's I combined my craft and chat and my pop-up so day. I had two mailing lists, but you know, some of you were on both lists and you're getting duplicate. Uh, messages anytime I sent out uh, about pop-up so day because I would send it out to both lists and so it's a little redundant plus I noticed I had sometimes I had people in those lists more than once so I went through them all I consolidated them into one giant mailing list so when it, anything that I have uh, if you're on that mailing list you should get only one email uh, with that if you're getting more than one let me know I may have missed a few people that were on there in duplicate. I think I got everybody. It was a bit of a bitch to do that, but in the long run, I think it's worth it um, for that. Okay. So, any other things? No. No. Exciting life here. He's getting all excited. He's getting a he shed. Yes. He shed, she shed. Oh, uh, yeah. Or should I say is he shit? Never mind. Okay. Time to go. Bye, everybody. See you later. Bye, say goodbye, Walter.